So I'm gonna try to finish these staff. Uh, we were talking about um, that the whole reason, I, I guess I can even really start from the beginning because it says that uh, the Moshe Rabbeinu Moses said in the book of Deuteronomy that he took the uh, the golden calf and crushed it, burned it, crushed it up, put the ashes into a uh, or the the dirt, or whatever he made from it, the sand into river that came down from the mountain and so therefore it's not an issue of breaking up idols and throwing them in the wind that they will turn into fertilizer because Moses did it so I'm Reloi Bisham Raya Reloi Mevyozer Al Pnei Hamai Biashkes Pnei Israel. so this week Sedra Parshas Kisisa it said that is that a proof it's written and uh, he made the, he put the ashes or, or the dirt or whatever, the dust from the golden calf. And he put it in the water and he made the children of Israel drink it. Like this coming, his intent was to put them through the ordeal of the sota, as we discussed in the previous video where we discussed that more in length in, in, in depth. So Marla Hemer Biyosi, like Far Namar, the Gamacha, Aim Asa Hamela, Hasira Hakmi Gavira, Shaza Salash Shaira, Mafletzes, Yukris Asas, Maflatsta, Biotic Visra, Banachal Kidra. Says that Bacha was the mother of Asa Hamelech of King Asa, and she removed the mistress that she had made, meaning an idol that she made for the Asherah for the tree idol, a mafletzes, like a pedestal, an idol. And uh, Asa, King Asa, he uh, took the Mafletzes, this idol, and he crushed it up and he burnt it in the river of Kidron, or the stream, the creek of Kidron. Umberloi Bisham Ryan? That was Rabbi answer. So the sages answered Rabbi Yossi, is that really a proof? Nachal Kidron Eino Megadal Tzmachim. The Kidron Valley is a total desert that doesn't grow anything. So it's not a um, it's it's not a worry that it could be uh, what do you call it? That it could be um, into uh, fertilizer. I'm sorry I fasted all day, so my mind is not clear, although it's not clear any time. Vuloi? And is that really uh, a good... Is it really true that the Kidron Valley does not grow any plants? <laughs> but it's not. We have a mission in Yuma. Eluva Elu. Arvin Baamo, Yodzin Lanachal Kidron, and Carmel Ganan and Lazavo, Moyalan Behem. The blood of the sin offerings would go down a pipe and would go to the Kidron stream. And the people would take that and sell it as as fertilizer, and that was for their gardens, and that was considered to be sacrilegious because they're taking the, 
blood of the sin offerings and using it for fertilizer, which is forbidden it to have any use from this blood, because it has to remain the temple. So Gemara answers, so then it shows that it is, there is, um, There is growth there because there's organic material that can be used for fertilizer. So the Gemara answers, Mekoymus, Mekoymus, Yeshbai. There are different places. Nachal Kidron is a big place. And Yesh Makayim, the Gadl Tzmach, Yesh Makayim, Shein, the Gadl Tzmach. In some places do grow, in some places do not. My Aflatsta. So we have this strange word, Maflatsta which is some kind of idol. So what does it mean, maflatsta? So maybe Huda, Rabbi Huda explains the compound word, to have a mafli letzinusa. It had this crazy amount of uh, insulting manner that they worshipped this. It was quite a disgusting way that uh, they use the this idol. The women would use the idol in a rather disgusting way um, that was considered mocking or scoffing um, but perhaps for an idol meaning that's how the scripture is describing it in a mocking or scoffing way because it was used in, in a way that was um, quite um, disgusting. What does it mean? Kizani Rav Yosef, and particularly to use an idol in this manner as well. Um, I, 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 if there are any children listening, they should cover their ears at this point. Um, if you're under 18, this this is probably a, an X-rated Gemara here. The son of Rav Yosef, because Rav Yosef taught, "Kemen zachers as zeloi for hoys and nevalas loy bechol yoy." She made a, a phallic idol, which she copulated with daily, used as a, uh, a masturbation. Term. I guess that's the technical term. I don't want to use anything. Say anything more than that. Amalahan Rabbi Yosi, but like Farnamar. So Rabbi Yosi brought it up. So that they destroyed as well, that quite disgusting idol um, that the queen had. So Amalahan Rabbi Yosi. So Rabbi Yosi answered the Chamam, another proof that you could um, grind down. Idol, and, and it's not a worry that it'll be used here, here, here for fertilizer. We have another uh, example in the story of Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18. Chizkyo Amalech, who was a righteous king, he was, uh, the sages say he could have been Mashiach, he could have been the Messiah, that's how. Righteous, this uh, his Melech was king. Hezekiah was probably one of the best kings in Jewish history, and I would say certainly the best king. I would say, although maybe I'm wrong, but it seems the sages agreed that Hezekiah was the best king after the split of the kingdoms. And we have a very, we have something that probably people are more familiar with from a Mishnah and Pesachim. It's actually in scripture, it's actually in the Bible, in Tanakh. And like I said, it's in 2 Kings 18. So we know that God, in the book of Numbers, God commanded Moses to make a copper brazen snake and put it up on a pole because people were being bitten by snakes because of a particular sin. And the, and the clouds of glory had left after the death of Aaron. And so snakes, poisonous snakes, were attacking the people in, in the desert, while they were wandering in the desert, uh, near the end of their wandering, before they went to the Holy Land. 
and God commanded Moses. What was that before Aaron died? In any event, they um, there were these snakes biting the people, and so they asked Moses to pray. The venom was burning. Venom. That that was the sensation that they got from this venom. So they were called fiery serpents. And God commanded Moses to make a snake and Moses and put it up on a pole. And anyone who looked at the pole, at the snake up in the pole, was healed. Uh, this is somewhat similar to something we discussed in uh, a previous Gemara here in Avodazar about how you know, things that look like other things have healing effects, and this is something that we find in other traditions as well. We find this also in uh, some homeopathy, I, I think. I've heard such things. Um, I, I will not attest to its validity, even if it's mentioned in Gemara. However, this story was in Scripture, so this, we, I, I would say we have to believe is true. Uh, certainly the Word of God that, that this event is recorded for, for, for us to know. And however, the problem, and, and so originally when it was made, it was made by the command of God. And yet the Bible tells us that Hezekiah destroyed the copper snake that Moses made because what had happened was, it's interesting, idolatry that comes from a biblical source is still idolatry. And, and so, you know, when we see the Mormons and so forth that have a clearly idolatrous theology, just the fact that they're reading the same books doesn't remove them from being idolaters and uh, and so too it, would, it seems that you know during the time in history when all of the Jews were worshipping idols when there were several times in history when that happened when idolatry became very popular whether, whether or not all of the Jews did so it's a matter of dispute, but idolatry was very widespread in Judea and, and almost universal in the northern kingdom of Israel. Although there were still pious people in the northern kingdom as well, as well as pious prophets, whose prophecies are included in, in Treyasa and, and the minor prophets. I don't, I don't have a problem calling them the minor prophets, because even though a lot of people will say that it's problematic, because the term minor does not mean that the pro their prophecies were minor or that the prophets were minor, but rather that the books were small books, and that's why and, and, you know, I don't see an issue with using the term the minor prophets. I, I, I saw something that I think Fulton Sheen said that he was giving a course on the minor prophets, and uh, a lot of the students were falling asleep. He was a college professor also. And he said, where should we put Habakkuk? And uh, one of the students got up, he's like, he could take YC because uh, I, I, can't, I can't sit here anymore. It's too boring. But I, I don't know what's so boring. I find the, the tray also to be some most interesting. So I guess it was just his delivery and not the, the subject matter. And so to my delivery right now, I can tell it's really not very good. You know, even, and so even people who are generally uh, quite talented can sometimes give over boring lectures, particularly if they're tired. And I'm very tired right now, I'll admit. So, uh, the issue was, even though it was made in a sanctioned way, in a way that was commanded by God, actually, the people... He began offering incense and so forth and worshipping this, making a shrine out of this copper snake. And 
and so Hezekiah thought it fit to destroy it and uh, did not see any reason to venerate it as a relic from Moses because it was a stumbling block. Even though it was a relic from Moses, what, and, and, you know, still it was a stumbling block because people started worshiping, which would also seem to indicate that one may venerate relics if they are not worshiped. And, but as soon as they be, get to be worshiped, they should be destroyed um, by Torah law. But until then, they could be kept, is, what, is kind of my feeling. As far as I was concerned, we do see certain Hasidic communities do have a certain level of veneration of relics and, you know, to wear the same clothing that the Rebbe wore, that the Tzaddik wore, you know, wear his hat or his yarmulke or something. What does it mean to venerate a relic? Not an object of worship, but a token of love for this person that we love very much, just as one might feel a token of love for a a gift or an item that was inherited from an ancestor. Um, Samarov engaged in this, and he was a person who was very careful against anything that was seen by idolatrous. He wore the Sansa Rubs or the Shinnah Rubs Bekisha on, uh, I believe it was Erev Rosh Hashanah every year, or Erev Kippur, I don't remember, by Mincha. That was his minhag to, to wear this relic of, of an old Sadiq. And if it was a shin of a rub, it was someone who he actually saw in his own, with his own eyes and, and had shaykhs to. And yet the Sabarov was very careful to only... And, and he would daven from the sitter of a bison caliber also at certain times of the year. He, he, he had, I don't remember, I think it was Arif Yom Kippur, he daven from sitter of Abba Bison Caliber, or maybe a poor, I'm not sure. He had a sitter from Abba Bison Caliber. And, uh, and yet sometimes relics get lost. I, 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 a few weeks ago, I had the Leviah that I performed for my dear friend Andrew Levine. And um, he noticed that not too far from his kever, was the kever of uh, someone that the Tolna Vishnitz Rebbe. Tolna, I've heard of Vishnitz, I've heard of him worse. The Tolna Vishnitz, that's, that's one I never had heard of before. So I looked up at my good friend, uh, you know, I haven't seen him in years, Baruch Amsel, Choshevi Yigerman, made a very nice website, kivarim.com, where he lists all of the kivrit tzadikim that he could find in all the graves of rabbis he could find in America, North America. So he has in the U.S. and Canada. I don't know if he has any in Mexico. Um, but uh, maybe he has, he has one in Guatemala. I don't think he put that one. <laughs> but uh, for Maven Yovin. But um, all this being said, um, I was reading on the website because people can write comments there about these rabbis, these sadiqim that they found. And he said that this um, this rabbi, his uh, Tolner Vishnitz, his children kind of were not interested in the whole rabbi vista. And he actually had the remainder of Tom's filling of the rabbi Bzushu. And they just gave it away. They didn't care. Maybe they didn't. I don't know, I mean, that would be... I, I can't understand how someone, even if they're not from, couldn't imagine that a, a museum would want to have such a thing, even if they didn't want it for themselves. But at least to have it in the museum, like in, uh, you know, the Jewish Museum, the YU Museum or something, you know. So, um... Even a JTS would probably be interested to have Tzvillin from Rebbe Zusha. You know, I'm sure. 
I'm sure that was when A.J. Heschel was still alive. I'm sure A.J. Heschel would have loved to have something like that, you know, if they didn't want to give it to a, to a from place like YU, you know? So, um, I, I saw recently there were, there was an auction of various relics. So they had the pipe of the Yiddin Kodesh, and they had a piece of the Baal Shem Tov's package. It's interesting that uh, such things. So anyway, uh, but so a, a relic from Moshe Rabbeinu, Chizkiyahu HaMelech had, and he didn't keep it because people were worshipping it, so it's been turned into a Vedasara. So anyway, Merula, so he destroyed it, and, uh, and he crushed it up. So, Misham Raya, so the Chachamim say that's not really good proof. Hari hu oimer v'yoimer Hashem u'moyshe n'zei l'chasarav. So, this was not also Ba'anah, because even if the even if the Jews were offered incense to this statue, or in front of this statue, it was not considered an idol. So then why did he destroy it? Is that Baltashkas? Especially, like we said, a relic from Moshe Rabbein. But um, it says that the Lord said to Moses, make for yourself a seraph, which means a burning thing. It could mean a burning angel, a fiery angel. But he understood it to mean a, a fiery snake. So, the fact that it says make for yourself, he understood that to mean make it from your own uh, from your own possession. Make it from your own money. Then all the oyster even even after Moses died it belonged to Moses or it belonged to his heirs so the fact that people were worshipping if someone would go and worship my car it would seem that I should have not be allowed to have Hanor from the car. However, um, or my car basically is, is uh, you know this if someone worships my car I don't know why anyone would want to worship this car it just happens to be what I'm <laughs> you know if, if, if the owner worships it then, then it becomes also but if someone else worships it without the owner's permission it doesn't become prohibited for use um, a person cannot prohibit something that doesn't belong to him and really, he didn't have to destroy, Hezekiah did not have to destroy it. So it was not an actual idol. Even it would seem that, that they're saying that either it's not an actual idol or because it didn't belong to the people, they had no right to. Uh, to worship it and, and their worship of it did not render it illegal for use the question is then uh, how did 
Hezekiah have the right to destroy it? And the answer is, is that a king can seize anything he wants. And so he probably seized it from the rightful heirs of Moses in order to destroy it just to avoid something that was similar to idolatry, even if it wasn't actually idolatry. So Marlehem, like for Nemar, Vyaz Vusham, is that's Behem, Vayisem David, Vanashim. So Vyasi brought another scripture. 2 Samuel 5, when David defeated the Philistines. It says that the Philistines left their idols. And David and his men picked them up. And what Rabbi Yossi understands them, what, how does he understand them? My mashma da hai v'yasim David lishma v'yasroyidu. So, Rabbi Yossi understands this, that he picked them up, means that he picked them up to crush them up and, and, and throw them in the, in the wind, destroy them. Uh, but the Chachamim ask, where do you get this from? That's what it means. The Sargum, the Sargum Rabbi Yaisi, Tizraim, Baruch Tesoim, Isaiah 41 says you should spread them out and the wind will lift them up. You should target and Basically, that basically what we said already, that you should crush them up and throw them in the wind. The wind will blow it away. Amrulay um, Mishamraya. So it shows that you could that they threw them in the wind, the dust, like dust in the wind, rather than throwing them into the Dead Sea. So there's Amrulai, Mishamrai, Ahari Oymer, Yusuf Ubeish. So the sages answered no. Because quite often the stories that we find in Samuel, particularly the life of David, we also find in Chronicles. So in 1 Chronicles 14, same story is mentioned, and it said that David burned it in fire. The idols that he took from the from the Philistines, he, he burned in the fire. May the the chsev be so famous, same shmami no. So if he burned it. That threw it in the woods. So we see from there uh, that he said to burn them. He didn't burn them. We say mamish. So what does it mean? That he actually took them and, and had enough from them. So why did he say to burn them? And why didn't he burn them? And how is he allowed to take them and have benefit from the idols? All right, that's a whole discussion. Okay, the Gemara is going to explain this later. We come up in any event. These two scriptures seem to be contradictory. I have a difficulty understanding this. Oh, the Rav Huna. As Rav Huna explains, the Rav Huna Rav Huna asks he looked, when he was examining the scripture. Asked, what's the difference between these? So, if you ever dove into Yisur Fuba Eish, Siv when you saw him. So, in, in, in these two verses, in, in the Chronicles, it says they burned in fire, and in, and in Samuel, it says that they were carried. Like Kasha. It's not a it's not a contradiction. There's no contradictions in Scripture. 
we could it's an amazing thing it's worthwhile to study the Talmud just to have all the answers to all the questions we have in scripture that seem to be contradictory so uh, before e- Itai the Gittite came, David said to, to Bert, but once he had a Gentile who would come and do his bidding, which was to nullify the idols, then he was allowed to take them and before he made the Kenyan on them. Chsiv, and, and don't just think this is just some rabbinical tradition. This is a clear uh, biblical statement. It says in 2 Samuel 12, Yikach, Zeteris Malcolm El Rosha, Yikmashkel Kikrasova, Evan, Yikarvati Al Rosh David. So it says that they took the crown from their king. Put it on, on, they weighed it and saw how much gold and precious stones there were. They put it on David's head. And this word Malka can also be understood Milkom, which also is Malka. Their king. But also the idol's name was Milkom. So they took the crown from the idol and put it on David's head. Mishari, Mishari Adonidhu. How is he allowed to do that? To take a crown from an idol and wear it? Not allowed to benefit from an, an idol, and not, o- not only the idol, but the ornaments of the idol? Marav Nachman, Itai Bo Vitla. So Nachman said that when Itai, the Gittite, came and Bovitla, and he uh, he nullified the idol. Mishkla Kikarzov, they weighed it, it weighed a measure of gold. Echimatsi Monachla. That's a pretty heavy, heavy-duty thing there. It's not heavy as my brother. <laughs> That's a heavy crown. How was David strong enough to wear such a heavy crown? That was a talent of gold, I would say. I don't know, Kikar, however you want to translate <laughs> this measure of gold. I'm of Yehuda Marav. So if Yehuda said the name of Rav, David didn't wear it, it's too heavy. But because Itai Agitai nullified the idolatrous nature of it, David was allowed to wear it if he wanted to. However, Yosef Rechanina said that there was actually a magnet, whether it was in it or above it, that made it um, uh, lighter. Perhaps you had two magnets with the same polarity, and so inside of it to um, to make it uh, float was a magnet. That made it lighter to wear, because it was only the weight of the magnet on David, and not the lower magnet. Let's say that's what I'm thinking. That's how I'm imagining this would work. So you have a lower magnet with north pointing up, and fitted inside the crown was a magnet with the polarity of north facing down. So north and north were pushing each other apart, but they were put together in such a way that it would float. 
you know, like sometimes you do with the, the, um, you put, you know, circle magnets, hold with a hole in the middle, like an O-shaped magnet, like a donut shape, you can put them on a stick, and, you, and it kind of floats, that type of thing. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, the harvest Darla. So because it, it had, it could have been a magnet above holding up, but gold is not magnetic. I don't think. Um, and that, but so the way I'm saying it makes more sense to me. I don't know. So uh, and that's how he was able to wear it. But Lazar Amar, Lazar says, "Evan Yakara Haisaba, Shishava Ki Karzahov." Rabbi Lazar said, no, it's a different, it's not that there was actually um, a talent of gold there, but rather that there was a stone in the crown, maybe it was a ruby or a diamond or something, that was so valuable that this small stone was worth a, a talent of gold. Um... That's how much its value was. So is Haisa Li Kifikudech Natsarti. So David wrote um, This was to me because I kept your laws. That's in Psalm 119. My Ka'amar, what, what belonged to him because he kept God's laws? So he said that the fact that he kept the law made him worthwhile to be the king. Oh, I can even turn my windshield wipers on. Baruch Hashem, my windshield wipers. You know, that's a big sin, though. Finally, have much of white So, uh, but my Dusa, so what te- is a testimony? What testifies to the fact that David was observant and so uh, of, the, of the commandments? Amr of Yeshua ben Levi, Shai Menich, Mubakim Tefillin, Tumasai. So, when he made his crown, he left a space in the crown for his tefillin. So this way he could wear the tefillin while he was wearing his crown. And it fit very well into the crown, his tefillin. Havi boy anuche, tefillin. Or that he wore the crown where he's supposed to wear his tefillin, and that looked very nice. So, um, rather, that's so I think I learned that wrong. He wore his crown where he's supposed to wear his tefillin. And that looked very nice on him. So they asked, was he supposed to wear tefillin? Summer of Shmuel Bar Yitzchak. That Mokim Yesh Baroish Leniach Boishtei Tefillin. There's enough room. On the head to wear two pairs of tefillin, uh, and some people have such a custom to wear Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam together. It's a minog, <coughs> particularly the Svardi Mekubalim, and um, <coughs> and so David wore his tefillin. And where he could have worn the made of top tefillin behind that is, I guess, where he wore the crown. I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, uh, my menu gets to wear them separately. So, so the via. So this brings us to another subject. The HCI, the has been a melech, the Yitnu Olav as a nazir as a They took out the prince. 
and they put on him a crown and a testimony. <coughs> when they were declaring, I think this is talking about, uh, where is it? Let's see, what does it say here? Uh, when Yoash Joe Ash, I guess, it, the son of Amazia, Amaziah, Amaziah, is how they say it. He was hidden in the temple because his grandmother was killing all of the heirs to the throne. So the priests hid him. Jehodiah, Je Jehodiah the priest. And, and then they declared him to be the king, this little boy, Joash. <coughs> Excuse me. So they took him out and they put on him the crown and the testimony. Days of Zuklila. The crown was David's crown. Edu, summer of Yehuda, Amarav, Edus, Ulave, Stavit, Shekol, Roy, the Malchus, Homsu, Shaina, Roy, the Malchus, Ena, Homsu. That if you're worthy to be king, crown fits, and if not, the crown won't fit. V'adoniyah ben Chagis m'snasei le'mor ni'amlech. Because we know the story of Adonijah, the king of, the son of David, the son of Chagis, one of David's concubines and wives, and he desired to be king, and he declared himself king. And uh, he wasn't worthy to be king, and he was a king. The Solomon was a king. Shloim HaMelech was king. So, so when he declared himself king, he wanted to wear the crown, and it wouldn't fit him. So he made himself a whole river vista. He made himself a whole malchus. That he got fifty. Uh, men to run it in front of him and, and, the, and, and the horses and the, and the, and the chariots. Myra Messiah, why does the scripture have to tell us this whole story and all of these things that Adonijah, Adonijahu brought? Tanakula, the Tule Um They all removed, they took some kind of a drug that destroyed their tchul, I don't remember, it's an interior organ, I think it might be the spleen, I don't remember which inner organ is the tchul, but they, it, because this organ makes it difficult to run, and so they... They, took, they destroyed this interior organ in order to help them run, and they also took off the heels of their foot, of their feet, these runners, in order to be able to run and step on thorns and things like that without, without uh, feeling any pain. Pretty crazy people there. Um, I have a new mission here. I'm just about home. How big is this stuff? It's not that big. Let's see. Let's... At least try to do the Mishnah Sha'al. It's a very interesting Mishnah. Maybe we'll make a separate video from this. Um, so this is where we'll end now, and then we'll make another video, maybe after the Megillah. I don't know. We'll see.